Content warning. The following story contains descriptions of animal abuse, gore, violence, occult activity, death, and cannibalism, including towards children. Albion always had troubles. Numerous conquerors came from Gaul from the south, Hibernaria from the northwest, Caledonia from the north, Kimru from the west, and Noragur from the east. Invasions were an irregular occurrence, usually creating small kingdoms which often war with each other, leaving distinct marks on the island nation. Coventry is sat near the center of Albion, and it is reflected in the barony of Coventry, led at the time by Baron Chester Seagrave. Coventry was enjoying relative peace 181 years after the failed invasion from Nortmani and 99 years before the first cases of Red Death. Barony had for the most part enjoyed being a large part of the wool and lumber trades. However, living in an era free of war was not the same as living in an era free of conflict. The first church in Coventry was built just recently, and with it, the first graveyard in the town. While burial was done on occasion in Coventry before the church was built, some of the town's residents practiced excarnation, leaving the dead to the elements until only the bones remained, or cremation, incinerating the body until only ashes remained. When the Baron outlawed such practices, it also came with enforcement that was not very popular. It was not uncommon for feudal knights to invade homes, taking away both the urns and bones from the grieving families, only to have these remains buried in the city graveyard, often in unmarked graves, as punishment to the families who disobeyed the baron. Soon afterwards, the baron's knights and the bishop's priests dug into the town's burial mounds, taking the gold and weapons back into the baron's treasury and reliquary, dumping the bodies into the ever-growing graveyard. It is likely this conflict the living had over death spilled over into the sunless lands, leading something back to the land of the living. The following account was taken from journals left from an unnamed priest and from knight Sir James. Sir James' work in dealing with monsters in Coventry and beyond led to the formation of Albion's first chapter of the Hunter's Guild, the Benefactors. March 2nd 2000 AUC. The serfs were unhappy to be digging in the old burial mound. The gold and treasures were taken long ago, and the graveyard is full, so we have to expand it. They keep telling me it's disrespectful to dawn, to hell, to Eid. I tell them that it doesn't matter, and to dig. There's over a dozen bodies to bury, and tomorrow is Sunday. We cannot do it then. As we dug, I saw an odd sight. In the distance, there were four animals who watched as we worked. A massive white shire horse. It looked almost skeletal in the distance with a very long white mane, almost long enough to reach its knees. There was a pair of ravens who watched us from the empty branches of a dead tree. Their eyes staring and judging us, and it almost looked like they had an extra eye in the middle of their heads. And the final beast was the strangest. A large black dog almost the size of a horse. It looked similar to the dogs that the Baron brought for hunting bears, but even bigger. This beast approached several times, and it was friendly towards me, but it growled when one of the serfs tried to pet it. Apparently, it only trusts me, even though it didn't take any of the food I offered it. I wonder if the dog knows. We dug our graves in the early afternoon, and as is traditional, I prepared the burial of one of the baron's dogs. In a graveyard, the first thing you bury will come back to protect the graveyard. If you bury a man, then the man will not rest, and he will spend eternity guarding the graveyard in the form of a shambling sexton. Quite honestly, the living sexton of the cemetery was already a handful, and I didn't need another one. So, instead, we would have a grim to guard this graveyard. 
The trick to getting a dog to become a grim is that it has to be buried while it is still alive. Baron's dog bit and snarled towards me and the others who kept it on long iron chains while we pulled it down into the open grave. The chains held it down, reminding me of Fenrir in chains. That wolf in the myth chewed the hand off of someone to get it captured. Fortunately, we were not so unlucky. Dog's howls were mournful as we piled dirt on it. The beast had run off when the first howls echoed through the mound. The howls continued even as it was covered in dirt, unable to move anymore, and when it was piled over, we placed a stone over the dog's grave, sealing it to be our grim guardian of the graveyard. More than a few serfs were disturbed by this. Apparently their beliefs ha had completely different ways of getting grave guardians. It isn't my fault they don't believe in the right god the right way. They will learn, or they will be joining the Baron's favorite dog soon enough. We buried the other bodies, and we went home to prepare for church tomorrow. Meals have to be prepared ahead of time. No cooking, no cleaning, no work allowed on Sunday, except for my work. Even the Baron's knights and the Baron himself attended service. Usually, at least. This following entry was made by Sir James only a few days after the new expansion to the graveyard was added. March 6, 2000 AUC The priests will no longer leave the rectory. There have been three dead priests in the last two days, and now the priests will not leave the church grounds that the rectory is on. Food is brought to them, and people come to them for advice. While the sheriff believes that it is a serial killer, leaving the priests in bloody piles on the streets of Coventry, the priests themselves are insistent that it is a bargast that is after them. A few different priests reported seeing a large black dog with shaggy hair, sharp fangs, and tearing claws following them around at night. Normally, I would dismiss it, just like most similar reports that are made to the sheriff. Except it isn't just the priest who saw it. There have been over a dozen witnesses who reported the Bargist. All of them are using the same description. A very large black dog with shaggy hair, sharp fangs, and claws. And at the scene of each murder, there are claw marks on the stones surrounding the bodies. The bodies themselves are little more than torn up pieces of meat and shattered bone where they're found. They're not so much buried as they are dumped into the graves. Their coins aren't taken. Any food or valuables they are carrying are untouched. The only thing taken from them are their crosses and rosaries. It is specific enough to feel like a wolf. However, Coventry hasn't seen wolves that walk among men in centuries. So we follow the patterns, and it seems that the Bargist appears at night, and whatever it is, it's a physical being and not an ethereal one. I've seen plenty of things in my travels. When I fought east of here against the Danes, I watched their dead men pick up axes and join the fray. To the south, I fought against strange men who breathed fire with every word and who could only be silenced by drowning them. To the north, I fought against horsemen who rode without heads and who could only be stopped by a golden crucifix. And to the west, I had seen wailing spirits who would have slayed me just by screaming at me if I did not have wax in my ears keeping out the noise. Whatever this Bargist is, it is a physical being, and it can be killed. Presumably, the following entry was written later that night, or maybe the next day. We found the Bargist. As soon as the sun set, I found a large dog even larger than a wolf. If it wasn't for the fact that it barked and howled, I would have thought it was an abnormally large wolf. The hair was shaggy, practically dragging behind the beast's steps. The claws were so long that just walking on the stones dug gouges into the stones. 
The thing no one mentioned before was the dog's eyes. They were bright red, filled with the fires of hell. Theophania and Richard were with me when we found the Barkist. The priests warned us when we saw the beast that we had to slay it in the name of Jesus Christ, otherwise the creature would not fall to its wounds. It would take an honest, honorable prayer to take down such a creature. We watched the Barghist, and it watched us right back. Behind the creature, there was the church, but it looked like the creature would not cross the boundary into sanctuary. Was it unable to enter a holy ground, or was it respecting sanctuary like everything else? Theophania finished her prayer first and drew her sword. Her sword drawn, the Barghist growled at her as she approached. She carefully circled around the creature, her sword drawn, while Richard and myself finished our prayers. I would later learn that Theophania saved our lives. Richard finished his prayer and he lunged towards the Barghist, stabbing his sword into the Barghist's side, stabbing clean through the fur and into the creature's belly drawing it along the spine, slicing through flesh and fur that emptied onto the street below the Barghist. Except the Barghist didn't even notice what Richard had done. Its entrails dragged behind it, coating the shaggy fur. And I could see its cold, dead heart on the ground, not pumping any life. And yet the Barghist still stood, not even carrying that half of it was dragging behind it. Maybe I need to do more, Richard said as he slashed through the creature's spine. I could hear the sound of bone on metal, sounding like the butcher's knife slamming into meat. It severed something, but the Barghist still dragged itself forward, trying to reach Theophania, who now took her mace and slammed it into the Barghist's skull cracking it open and leaving the poor monstrosity's brains on the ground. That finally stopped the beast. I was frozen the entire time, too scared to lift my sword in the defense of my compatriots. I'm, I'm so sorry. I do not know why I froze. I began only for Theophania to raise her hand. That didn't work the way the priest said it would. What do you mean? I asked her, and Richard turned to me like I was stupid, his golden eyes shining in the night, identical to the eyes under Theophania's helmet. Is it not obvious? I prayed to Jesus Christ, and it did not stop the beast. Theophania prayed to Freya, and she was able to take it out. I don't think it was the prayer. I think it was where the beast was struck. It lost its heart on the ground, and the flesh isn't warm. But the brains broke in into the ground, took it down. If we encounter more like this, then we need to break the skull and get to the brains, Richard said, only for Theophania to laugh. That isn't why my mace worked where your sword failed. I prayed to Freya, but my prayer was genuine. Your prayer was not, Richard. Prayer has to be genuine. A prayer to a god you do not believe in is like plying flit or favor from a lord that you do not serve. If you strike these creatures down, keep your oath honest, Sir James. Theophania advised me as we left the body for the corpse cart. There had been no other odd deaths for weeks, which led to everyone relaxing, only for new strange things to occur, as recorded by the priest. April 1st, 2000 AUC. We are preparing for the feast of Saint Selic, Saint of Hibernaria. After the knights took down the Barghist, everything was quiet in Coventry. We haven't even had a single death in weeks. The feast is important, and we will have many visitors from all over the barony, including pilgrims all the way from the countryside. We prepare the roasted pheasant, boar, and even salted fish from Oceanus. This is going to be a glorious feast. We even had quiet volunteers from the Baron's castle. They must be servants who worked deep in the castle. 
because they were as pale as geese, but they listen without talking back, and they work hard without complaint. Perfect Christian folk. This feast is going to be amazing. Even the cooks were these pale castlemen, but the food smells amazing. The mouth-watering smell of delicious salted pork. I snuck a piece for myself. Practically melted in my mouth with how much fat remained on the still red muscle, and the way blood had dribbled down my throat felt like communion. I don't normally enjoy meat that is still bleeding. However, the way these cooks made it, it just tastes amazing. Nothing even comes close to it. The wafers we passed out taste like sawdust, and it sucks the life from our tongues. Fortunately, the wine we drink tastes incredibly salty and rejuvenating, still warm from wherever they got the wine from. It wasn't from the church's stockpile. That was untouched when we saw it. However, wherever they got the wine from, I love it. I am considering replacing my stockpile with this salty wine. Wine is wine, and I can bless it all the same. I just have to say my prayers to someone. Yeshi? No, that's not quite. Joshi? No. Christina? They lived in heaven, right? No, not heaven. Haven? No, that definitely didn't sound like the right place. LCL? No, that's definitely not right. The thought of all those faceless angels wearing those creepy mirror masks frightened me. Pandemonium? That was certainly closer. No clouds, no sun, no faceless abomination, and fires to warm the old bones. Hell? No, not hell. Hell. Yes, that was it. The empty throne in hell. I just had to say the prayer to hell while the cooks prepared the feast. The baron and his knights left to go hunting for boar, those silly goats. We had plenty of boar here. The priests had to dig the boar up from the graveyard. There was plenty of tasty salty pork from those dusty graves. Fresher the grave, the fresher the pork. I don't know why I'm craving pork so badly. I used to find the flesh unappetizing, but ever since I nicked my hand on the Burgess's tooth when I drug it into the pyre, it has been all I craved. The best pork I found out doesn't come from pig, but from the serfs around me. It was so joyous I had to share my joy with my fellow priests. I prayed to hell, and I would leave a single drop of my blood in each bottle of wine. It doesn't say that in any of our holy books, but the empty throne tells me that it is the right thing to do. I fed pieces of my flesh and drip drops of blood to my brothers, and now we are all holy in hell, too. We replaced that nasty e cross with a carving of an empty throne. Better the throne than the cross. Better to take than give. Better to gain than sacrifice. In time, the church ground stopped burning us, and we had the chance to finally make it our own. The blood and the flesh spread amongst all of Coventry, except the body barren and the nasty knights. They refuse to eat at the church, but that's fine. We have plenty of pork from the graveyard. The very best pork is from the shredded corpses. They're still quivering and not quite dead, just yet. The hellhound brought us the very best. We just didn't understand its blessing yet. When the feast is finished, the church of the empty throne will be full, and we will spread across Albion and then in time Europa, until every knee bows before an empty throne, and no one even remembers any of those petty princes and princesses that infest the world. I have to help the cooks. They have run out of pork, and the last of the priests have been used up. It is my great honor to be served in the name of hell. This is the last entry of the priest journal. It was coated in what was later proven to be blood, wine, and candle wax made from human fat.
which served to preserve it as it was completely covered in the wax. The Baron's boar hunt went on for days. By the time the Baron and the Knights returned to Coventry, it was a completely different place. April 5th, 2000 AUC When we returned on Thursday, it was like Coventry saw battle and pestilence at the same time. I had seen war. I knew what war smelled like, and we could smell it even leagues away from Coventry. It was odd, though, because there were no ravens and there were no crows in the air. We rushed as quickly as we could, and when we saw the town, I could feel my heart break, and we could only ride in silence as we searched the town. The doors and shutters of all the homes banged in the wind, their homes empty with no one inside. All of their hearths were empty and cold and had been for days. We had seen plenty of brown stains on the cement, but the blood was cleaned away, apparently licked away by wild dogs. At least, I hoped it was wild dogs. The burning pork smell and the smoke we found was the church. And it was where everyone left in Coventry stood. We found no bodies in Coventry, and when we made it to the burning church, we found out why. The bodies were chopped up like it was in a butcher shop. Instead of clean cuts and strips of flesh, however, everything was piled up into twitching gore piles. The entrails, organs, and flesh still moved in apparent animation as they were roasted over the flames of the burning church. Even as the flesh cooked and burned, it was still moving, as the residents of Coventry consumed the cursed meat. Even the residents who were still standing, still chewing, still eating one another, were dead. I could see the blood underneath their skin forming bruises on the bottom of their limbs as they tore at each other, tearing flesh. I saw the holes in their throats, their chests, and even their hanging entrails, where the food they consumed simply fell out of their bodies, only for others to eat the fallen flesh. Any of the residents who were no longer able to move or unable to defend themselves were torn apart and butchered by the ones who could still move, many of them still wielding knives. None were spared the harsh treatment of this horde of Hellions. And by none, I mean none. Coventry had many children, once. It had many children. Children not equipped to defend themselves. Children unable to protect themselves, let alone their younger siblings. Some barely older than infants, and most of them still infants. Their flesh was eaten with everyone else's and they were torn apart easily. But they still moved, and when I saw the eyes of an infant who was barely more than a head and a spine snap its toothless maw my way, I lost my lunch. At this point, even though we surrounded the burning bonfire, we were not targeted by the Hellions. Yet. Either they didn't consider us a threat, or they were more interested in the food that was already on hand. The Baron ordered us to draw our arms and strike at the crowd, bringing them all into the fire. We drew our swords, shields, spears, spades, spedums, and scythes as we pushed the bodies into the flames together. They did not fight back. They did not care about us. They didn't even notice what we were doing. They just kept eating as they were pushed into the flames, as we pushed them and watched them both burn and melt in the flames. We watched as eyes melted into screaming, steaming piles in their sockets, and yet they kept eating. We watched as flesh burned and peeled away from the bone, 
that blackened and cracked from how hot the fire burned. And yet, they kept eating. We watched as the flesh was ash and charcoal, the bone little more than brittle cracked sticks, while the flames danced across the bones like pandemonium's flames. And yet, they kept eating. They were bones, ash, and dust. And still, the bones, ash, and dust kept consuming bones, ash, and dust. There was nothing left to destroy. And as the fire waned, we watched in horror as the ash kept moving slowly, constantly consuming itself, never gaining sustenance, but always drawing joy from its own consumption. Feeling lost at that point, I felt I had no other choice. I removed my sword and I pointed it at the weak flames and the moving ash. Per what Theophania said, that it didn't have to be a prayer to any specific god, it just had to be a genuine honor, something I held in high regard, something greater than myself. So I recited my knight's oath while pointing my sword at the ashes. I will defend the frail and the weak. I will uphold honor at all costs. I will never bring harm to one who has not harmed me first. As I recited it, the ashes started to stop moving so much. And for the first time, I could hear a whisper from the bones, ash, and dust. Stop this. You can't stop us. The empty throne will rise. I ignored their words. If they were trying to stop me, then that meant I was on the right path. I will never slay what I can instead maim. I will never maim what I can instead disarm. And now some of the other knights were joining me in reciting their oaths. My Christian compatriots instead said the Lord's Prayer, while others prayed for favor from Don or Odin. Their words echoed along with mine as the whispers grew louder. You'll only send their souls to burn. You cannot rescue them. We will swallow them for all eternity. The voices echoed in all directions, including behind us, but we stayed strong in our united words. Many different words in many different faiths, asking for the same thing, to end the hellish horde that took over our town. I will never disarm what I can instead fatigue, and I will never fatigue what I can instead speak with, and I will never raise my hand without first reaching out first. I recited, finishing the oath as the echoes became screams. We are eternal. We are the ones who will destroy all of Albion. We cannot be stopped. I repeated my oath again. I will defend the frail and the weak. I will uphold honor at all costs. I will never bring harm to one who has not harmed me first. I will never slay what I can instead maim. I will never maim what I can instead disarm. I will never disarm what I can instead fatigue. I will never fatigue what I can instead speak with. And I will never raise my hand without first reaching out first. I finished and my compatriots finished as well, leaving the ashes only ashes. The last of the bones broke into dust and it was now still and quiet. Beyond the church, I could see a white horse, two ravens perched on a rocky hill, and a large black dog. The old guardians of the old burial mounds. They protected the dead from desecration from the living, but they also protected the living from things that crawled out from the graveyards. And when the town broke their covenant with the guardians, their guardians broke their covenants as well. If I was to guess, the priest did not create a grim when he buried that dog alive. Instead, he summoned a hellhound and the evil inside the hellhound spread among the priests unchecked, then through the town. How it went unnoticed, I don't know yet. This evil spread unchecked in my own town that I am supposed to protect. Then how many other similar beasts live out there? How many broken covenants were there? How many beasts? How many unprotected people to protect? That night I swore I would leave the baron's employ 
and I would find like-minded knights to help others, to uphold the covenants, and to save those who cannot save themselves. But first, I had a new covenant to make with the old graveyard guardians. It is not known what the exact details of the covenant he made with the graveyard guardians. What is known is that the modern city of Coventry has over 100 different graveyards and one of the most diverse forms of keeping their dead. Everything from excarnation, donating organs, cremation, tombs, graveyard burials, taxidermy, burial at sea, and even endocannibalism. The old church grounds are barely a foundation. As for what happened to the ashes of the hellish Hellian horde, it is not stated in any document as far as I can find. As for the graveyard guardians, they are still seen throughout the city to this day.